So the Yggdrasil, Northern Germanic tribes, Old Norse tradition. And in that, this is, again, like we talked about in our first session, that this is referenced as the sacred world tree. And in this world tree, we have three realms, nine worlds, and a lot of interdependent relationships. We have, like we talked about in the last session, the underworld, the middle world, and the upper world. And in this context, there's a whole relationship of, you know, similar how we see with the tree and all the branches that reach to the heavens, and then the trunk that references the space for this terrestrial realm, and then all of the root systems that reflect in the top of the tree, that there's this whole underground network, right? Interdependent network. In the Yggdrasil, this uh, tradition, this is known as also the tree of knowledge, as we talk about, and the tree of the universe and the tree of fate. It is the axis mundi, the center of the creation of the entire universe. And in this context, it's referenced as the cosmovision, the cosmovision of how creation creates itself. You see, again, the upper canopy, you see the middle earth and the root system below. So the ash tree is the tree that's associated with the Yggdrasil and also referenced as the horse of Odin. Some reference that Yggdrasil might literally translate to be the ash tree of the horse of Odin. That's one translation because Odin rides a horse along the tree from world to world. And Yg is related to the name Odin. Odin is the god of the Yggdrasil. So it goes with the story is that he hung himself on the Yggdrasil, the tree of life, for nine days and nine nights to commune with the interdependent intelligence of all of the realms and to really understand the hidden wisdom and knowledge between all of the realms and how they are coexisting and collaborating, co-shaping together. And in this way, there's a great relationship with the runic, the runes that go with all of this, this entire cosmovision. We're going to touch on it. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But for those that are really interested in divination, runes is a really beautiful, powerful way to start to understand how to commune with the divine realms in this divinatory source. So one of the things that we're both really noticing and aware of is this idea that shows up in a lot of these cosmovisions where the life of the human realm, the life of humans is connected and dependent, interdependent with the life of trees because the trees themselves, these world trees, these access points are also the home of all of the terrestrial beings and the home of the gods. And so when a tree world tree or cosmic tree dies or passes, then that affects the life of giving nature of the humans too. There's a relationship. And we see this over and over and over again. So in this way, trees are referenced as, as holy sacred beings, holy sacred beings that are both a merging point of immortal teachings, life that feeds death, that feeds life again. And they're also mortal living beings. And in that way, it's understood in a lot of these older traditions that our job as humans is to tend to them and protect them and care for all life moving forward by also tending to these trees. So in this way, we really reference and we revere this time is of these eight weeks is sitting with these holy beings and getting to know them. I love this phrase about the Yggdrasil. It is the holy place of the gods where they held court each day as silver drops of dew trickled, trickled over the tree's leaves. And there's a really beautiful relationship here too with the dew in a lot of the older alchemical studies. I used to study alchemy quite a bit with a lot of different alchemists. They talk about the power and the teaching and the medicine of the dew that rains off of the trees. And that the dew is also a celestial water that is assisting in bringing more life moving forward. So we see this relationship of how life is continuing to in relationship to the relation with the water and the trees. So here we see this really beautiful image of the nine realms. So first we'll look at the three realms and then go to the nine realms. So as the world tree, it said there are three roots, an air root, a water root, and a root in the other world. And in this tradition, it's referenced as hell, i.e. the other world. Now, something that's really worth considering in the dialogue or the terminology of the other world, even in ancient Egypt and Kemet, other world doesn't ne necessarily reference the dark underworld where demons reside. 
it's another dimension where souls are on their journey, moving back into this, moving towards the celestial kingdom, where there's a great transformative process occurring for souls to continue home to the stars again. So I'd like to just bring that forward as a way to consider the other world. Now in this, the world tree is the connection between the life cycle of human and non-human relations, the four legged the swimming ones, the standing ones, the two-legged insect beings, all of the living beings of this world, and of course, of the cosmos. So there's an interdependent relationship between creation creating itself, and that the this these realms are reflection of creation of divine principles. It's also related to destiny. And we think about that right now, you know, the, the life-giving nature and the life of trees is connected to the destiny of us too. And so we really get to know the interdependent nature of the destinies that we're calling forward, but based on how we tend to this holy place, this holy realm of the earth. Also the world tree and these realms references time. And when we think about time in relationship to trees, it's, and even like the stone beings or the trees themselves, they're working in different timelines. And we're learning a lot about different timelines when we get to know the natural world and we get to know trees and different kinds of trees. You know, I remember this one time where I, I went up to one of these older forests up here and got to sit with this particular tree, the bristlecone pine tree. And it was the oldest tree in this old growth forest. And I remember when we we're sitting around this tree, the ancient bristlecone, they're considered to be maybe some of the oldest trees in the world, one of them. One of the things that we all really were tuning to is the the age of this tree and how much this these this forest has experienced and seen, and how young we are actually in relationship to the wisdom of these trees, and that their timeline of time is longer periods. And so there's a lot of wisdom that they receive and are carrying based on their observation experience and tending to of ecosystems for such a long time. So this is a beautiful opportunity for us to attune to time and timelessness and wisdom embedded in the trees and their timeline of how they grow and sane and thrive. Mm. And then finally, the world tree is really connected to, in this context, attuning to the harmony and balance between all things. And so this is where that terminology in my culture, enough is really related. You know, enough is a deep rooted respect to assist and support and acknowledge how to maintain balance and thus maintain harmony between all realms. Okay, so now we're just gonna take a moment to acknowledge the nine worlds of the Yggdrasil, of, of also known as the nine worlds of Asgard. So this idea, this is a beautiful image of the Yggdrasil and it's this immense tree that sprang forth in the primordial void of Gnun Gaga. And this is also really parallel to a lot of other cosmovisions where there's this emergence or coming forward out of the void, out of the great mystery, the unknown, the great unknowingness. And from this coming out of the void, the great unknowingness come the nine worlds of Asgard, the home of the deities ruled by Odin. Now, again, there are three worlds, you know, we're seeing triads consistently already. We saw the three roots, and now we see the three worlds. There's the supernal world, world, the medial world, and the infernal world. This is also where Valhalla is, which is the considered to be the afterlife for warriors. So we're getting into threes, 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 threes. So here's just a, you can take time to read through these on your own, but I'm just going to acknowledge these nine realms. The Alheim, the realm of the light elves, you know, this is where we start to see relations of Tolkien's studies and Tolkien's interests. You see them playing out in relationship to this beautiful cosmovision. Also some of uh, Rowling, we see that and it's, it's with her work too. This is a realm of light. And then you see Asgard is the realm of the gods themselves. It's considered to be a golden realm, a city in the clouds of magic. Hell, which is where we hear the term hell in relationship to, you know, the Christian context, but it comes from here. This is the realm of the dead. And this is also hell is a God, the God of the dead. And this is also where souls are journeying, part of where they're journeying to find their way home again. Yatunheim, 
is the acknowledgement of the rocks and the mountains and the the rocky gorges, everything, the plants, everything in that way. This is the Yatunheim. Midgard is the realm of mortals where we are. Knowledge is this earth. Muspelheim, the realm of the flame fiery ones. This is where we see the relationship of volcanoes, volcano dwellings. Some traditions, ancient traditions talk about entire cities in the volcanoes and the mountains. And this is the this one for the Yggdrasil. Nivelheim is the realm of the cold, the frost ones, um, where blizzards are. And this is really interesting too. We think about Antarctica as an example. You know, it's I think it's the largest continent in the world, and it's the one we know the least about. Mm. And they've been finding a lot of really interesting things in Antarctica. So I think it's worth looking into that if you're interested. And then Svarothalvheim, the realm of the darker elves and the dwarves, jeweled palaces with luminescent fields. And the Vanneheim, the realm of the Vanir, who are elementals. They're the living beings of the forest and the seas. And in this way, they're known to hold thousands of islands. These are seafaring towns. So there's just a little bit of the nine realms. And uh, I recommend getting to know this deeper. There's so much. We couldn't spend the entire eight weeks just touching the tip of the iceberg of this particular cosmovision. So this is just a doorway.